Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Phosphor G North America's innovative experiment in supply management. Thanks for coming to Magical Post Just in three brief movements. And I should point out at the beginning, although Kevin pointed out for me earlier, I did not realize the scatological implications of my title when I put it. That's not the point I was getting at. <laughs> so you can see from the pictures. Um, so thanks also for the good folks at Cardi B for employing me, letting me work on PostGIS. Like a lot of software as a service companies, Cardi B has a strong open source ethic, uh, stronger than most actually, because their system is built on top of open source components. Uh, the DB in Cardo DB is actually PostGIS, PostgreSQL. So much of what I'm actually talking about today can be run in the Cardo DB cloud, and some of my examples actually do that. So um, this is supposed to be magical PostGIS. Um, the Apple-esque name, it's magical, it's singular. It's the most singular experience you can have with a database. Um, perhaps the Apple-esque name drew you to the room, but in retrospect, maybe I should have called it uh, show and tell. That's what I have is a lot of material about my favorite toys and bits and pieces, or, uh, or stupid extension tricks, but perhaps a bit more honest. So I got some crazy examples of crazy extensions. But regardless, on the playbill, it is magical post list in three brief movements. And I want to give this talk because I feel like people, people aren't appreciating the kind of deep and beautiful magic that they can create using little more than a standard database backend. Like too often people have this, this utilitarian view of their database. They don't, they don't really like their database much at all. It's, to them, it's just a bit bucket. You know? It just holds a bunch of tables. They stuff data in. They drag data out. And some people hate their database so much that they hide it away behind an object relational mapping layer, like an ORM, so they can pretend the bit bucket isn't even there in the background doing the hard work. And, and they're really missing out. They're really missing out because once you get to know it a little more intimately, you come to realize that your database is a beautiful, beautiful thing. You know, it's not just a bit bucket. It's a magical toolbox with all kinds of good stuff inside. So this talk is actually not so much about PostGIS as the kinds of things you can do with PostGIS when you combine it with the magic that's inside the PostgreSQL database. And PostgreSQL is so magical because it was designed from the start to be more than a bit bucket. Michael Stonebreaker, Stonebreaker had always, already spent a decade um, pushing around bits in the Ingress project when he dreamed up his next generation database in the 80s. And he wrote a paper, The Design of Postgres, uh, which is fun to read actually, 20 years, 20, 30 years down the road, which laid out his goals for this new and at that point unwritten database. And those goals, which form the foundation for PostgreSQL's awesomeness and for PostGIS in particular. Um, in particular, support for complex objects, geometry and geography are complex objects, so are rasters. Um, user extensibility, which is what allows PostGIS to exist at all, since it allows anyone to add types and functions to the database at runtime. And most of the fun stuff in PostgreSQL takes advantage of the extension points. Active features are a pretty common database feature now, and they let the database take a, an active hand in managing data flow, not just a bit bucket. And then the relational model, it ties everything together. What makes the system as powerful as it is, is that every piece of information is a tuple, and tuples are collected in tables. So Postgres lived as Stonebreaker's academic project for almost a decade, but it was useful enough that by the time he moved on to other projects, it already had a user base who kept it alive. They fitted it out with the new SQL standard. Eventually, it grew into the PostgreSQL development community that we have today. So for our first movement, I want to talk about what's possible when you start making use of PostgreSQL's native full text search support. Because if there is, if there is a phrase that makes me want to put my head in the oven, um, it's, we're using PostGIS with Elasticsearch. Ah. And I acknowledge, you know, Lucene and Elasticsearch, they're nice tools, but boy, I hope, I hope if you, really, you really need every scrap of functionality they offer. Because once you have two different data storage and query systems strapped together, everything in your overall system gets more complex and uglier. You know, assuming hopefully that your relational database is your point of truth, still all the changes have to be replicated over to the Elasticsearch system, which adds a synchronization step to all the work. And if your data changes fast enough, that can get quite complex. But, but that's actually the easy problem. The hard problem is that once you have two query endpoints, any query that involves both a text search and a spatial component of sufficient complexity to require PostGIS requires that the middleware starts to coordinate the query process. Um, 
So first it talks to one of the systems and says, uh, give me all your records that match this text search query. And then it has to take all that information and walk over to the other system and say, hey, give me all the records that you have that are in this set and fit the spatial clause on that. And depending on the query, the order you want to do that in, text first or spatial search, is going to vary. So basically, you have to build a little query planner in your middleware. And what a terrible idea, <laughs> particularly since PostgreSQL already has a full text search engine built into it. So PostgreSQL T-Search, it's got all the basic capabilities you want in a full text engine. It's got stemming, you know, so it understands that foxes and fox are basically the same thing, that running and run are basically the same thing. It's got weighted searches, so you can give more precedence to parts of your document, and then make the title more important in your search. It's got the ability to create your own dictionaries, so it's not just stuck in an English language dictionary space. You can use it multilingually. You can rank your results based on the quality of match, um, and you can even highlight your results, point out the parts of the result that caused the match to happen. But, so, that's cool, but what does this have to do with magical PostGIS? Well, if your full text engine and your spatial engine are in the same database, you can run compound spatial text queries and not have to think about the execution path or the efficiency, because the database engine just does that for you automatically, or magically, as it were. So, here's a fun example application. Uh, it's built using geographic names, in this case from geonames.org, because geographic names are basically words, um, just really, really short, documents that come with locations. <coughs> but any document type with location can be used to build a cool text spatial location application. So with a little data mangling, you can turn the GeoNames geographic location data into a table. It looks like this, you know, primary key, the name, the location. In order to get full text searching enabled, you have to add a TS vector column. So we add a column with type TS vector, and we populate it with TS vector data using, in this case, an English configuration, because uh, I took data from the USA, but more about that later. And finally, we index it using <laughs> the full text index for TS vector, which is a GIN, a generalized inverted index. Uh, it's also used in Postgres support for indexing array types. Now, there's a magic parameter in this SQL, uh, the word English. So we specified an English configuration, so English grammar rules are used to determine that oak and oaks and age and aged are basically the same thing to identify all the articles and pronouns that can be ignored and to reduce the size, to reduce the phrase to a simpler vector. So two TS vector gives us a column of TS vectors we can query. So we've got that on our table now, but how do we query a column of TS vectors? Uh, to query a TS vector, you need a TS query, which itself is a logical feature, a logical filter. So you can construct one as a combination of AND and OR clauses. Um, optionally, you can weight them uh, you can set them up with partial matching. This is a query which would match entries for both oak and tree or oak and ridge. And we can use that query in a full text search of our 2 million record geographic names table using the at at operator and finds all the TS vectors that match that query. And it turns out there's only three. But the really, really interesting thing is how quickly it finds the answer. Well, just 17 milliseconds. That's a pretty good fast search of 2.2 million records. And the best part is now the full text search is handled inside the database, so it's possible to build efficient compound spatial text queries, like this one. So this combines a search for all records with oak and tree with a spatial filter restricting the result to just the nearest 100 kilometers. And because both clauses are handled by the database, all the database machinery is at your disposal, figuring out the most efficient way to access the rows. And here's how it did it for this example. Here's the explain, it's the explain analyze, so it's the actual the actual path it shows. Reading from the bottom up, you can see in this case, the database first ran the full text search because it was the most selective, only returned 59 rows. Um, if you did the all things within 100 kilometers filter, you probably would have gotten several thousand. Then it applied the spatial filter, which removed 57 of the 59, leaving just two. I think this must not match my uh, original example, which had three. So I showed a lot of SQL, and now you're probably wondering where the magic is. Maybe you don't consider SQL to be magic. Um, usually the magic comes when you bind the power of the SQL into a user interface so you can see it, so you can make the, make the power visually manifest. So take all those place names, subset them quickly using text cert, and pass the result into a heat map. So here's a heat map um, for my own regionalism in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, in Cascadia, we called mountain lions cougars. And see down at the bottom there, there's a link to the blocks site. You can get that and play with it live yourself. Um, there's all kinds of oddities. It's actually surprisingly fun to see the patterns in place names. Um, and you can see how, we, how, we, how do we perceive ourselves, right? Um, 
northern people, southern, well, places, but people name places, eastern folks, and here's a strange one, western folks. <laughs> Everybody is western. I guess this is the Eurocentrism <laughs> coming into play. All of North America is western when you're originally coming from Europe. Okay, so that was magical, but perhaps not practical enough. So how about this example? Um, suppose you're a county, and you have some standard address and parcel data, and you want to set up a simple parcel finder app for folks to look up their house information. So how would you do that? You might want a Google-style interface, just one, just one input field and some magical autocomplete. Well, you're a county, so you've got GIS data. You've got a street center line network. Actually, you probably have an address register. It's got a street name, an address number, city, county, for every site address in your jurisdiction. You can make use of that, but how? You don't want a form with five fields. Um, you might uh, back. The only trick to doing autocomplete is you have to be able to look up not just the words that have already been entered, but the bit that are already in the middle of typing. And fortunately, PostgreSQL text search can do that too. Uh, in the TA, two TS query function, uh, I'm not just looking for 256, which is the part they've already finished typing and put a space after. I'm also looking for words that start with MAI. PostgreSQL text search calls that prefix matching. But you can build a TS query with partials. So with prefix matching on our database and a simple JavaScript UI, jQuery UI in this case, an autocomplete form, you can have a really fast autocomplete search box up and running in a couple minutes. And it's uncannily accurate because you've fed it the whole address register. It doesn't really care about word order either. And if you want to get really fancy, in addition to having one row for each uh, street address, you could also take your centerline streets and derive an extra row for every street intersection. Main and 45th, Broadway and 2nd. Um, so the last example here, they all typed them out, it's kind of interesting. Because uh, in the search field, we've got uh, 349 East Main Street. But it's not East Main Street, right? It's E Main St. But on the map, Google Maps in this case, we have East. It's all spelled out, East Main Street. So different sources, right? The, the actual data I'm searching is from the county. Who knows where Google derived their names from. Different sources, different interpretations about how to abbreviate these things. Um, the trouble is, what happens if we look at the map and say, oh, I want to search for something on East Main Street? What if we try to search for the names as they appear in the base map? 349 East Main St, using the fully spelled out word East, no answers. Or we just search for Main Street, but spelling out street in full, or searching for addresses on South 2nd Street, as it appears on the map, no success, right? So. What's going on here? The full text search has broken the street names down into words, and they've saved the words in the full text engine, but the words aren't like English words. Like they, don't, they don't stem, you don't take off the S's and the ings. They have their own grammar and synonyms, so the search is failing. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Uh, if, instead of treating the words in our addresses as parts of language, as parts of English, well, you recognize that they're addresses and treat them as parts of addresses. So the system should know that when you wrote st, st, you meant street. And when you wrote n, you meant north. Then the searches for abbreviations would work. Uh, or searches against data that was itself abbreviated would work. So PostgreSQL T-Search allows you to create your own dictionaries of synonyms and words you want to ignore or words you want to replace with other words. So I created a custom dictionary for street addresses, uh, the PostgreSQL addressing a dictionary, and bundled it up as an extension. So for my basic example, um, the one I first sh just showed you a video of, I used the standard simple dictionary set, which basically does almost nothing. Um, it's a little better for this purpose than using the English dictionary, because you don't want your street name stemmed. But it still is going to drop out things that aren't English words, like n and st. So it's not that good for our purpose. Um, a search would be better if it used, um, well, the, the, simple, the simple dictionary is only going to use uh, treat, the word, treat the abbreviations as if they're words. So we ended up having 128 considered a word, that's fine. E is considered a word, st is considered a word, that's not ideal. 
But if we parse the same thing using the addressing dictionary, the custom address dictionary comes into play, and the abbreviations are expanded out. So E becomes East, STU becomes Street. The only change you have to make to the search application is change the addressing dictionary. So instead of using simple, we use the addressing EN dictionary, which is what the extension installed. And now when we run these searches, East Main Street works. South Second Street, fully spelled out, works. Things even work when the users mix up the correct addressing order, put the directions la last. Um, so it's not, not that uncommon to see, you know, 45th Street North used interchangeably with North 45th Street, doesn't care, um, or even put the house numbers last. So treating your, uh, treating your words as addresses in the full text index, all of a sudden you get, it's not, a, it's not God's own geocoder, but for the purpose of doing address autocomplete, it's more than good enough. So rather than give a bunch of URLs, uh, here's the modern version of AOL keywords for this section. <laughs> Take your notes. If you search for PostgreSQL full text in 9.4, that'll give you the latest documentation on full text search. Um, and if you want to find the addressing dictionary, search for PRAMs in GitHub, and you'll find that there as one of my repositories. So, second movement, a brief pause where the orchestra flips over the sheet music. Da, tunes up again. Okay, on to the second movement, federation, <coughs> federated systems. So this is very hacky, but enjoyable. So first we're upwards federation. I want to push some data up from my local database into a cloud storage system. Uh, and in deference to my employer, and actually because it's kind of easy to sync to a system where there's no impedance mismatch, po copying PostGIS to PostGIS, pretty easy. I'm going to be showing how I federated my local PostGIS to uh, CarterDB cloud PostGIS. So first I got some open data from the city of Victoria where I live, a uh, shapefile of public art in the city. I load into my local PostGIS using shape to PGSQL, view it in QGIS, there it is, dot, 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 dot. Um, then I load the same data into CarterDB, and there it is. It's a little more comprehensible with a base map underneath. Uh, style it up using the Carter B visualization tools, make it all pretty, uh, in this case with a categorical style. So now I've got a copy on one side and a copy on the other side. But how do I get my changes? You know, I'm going to pretend I'm a city manager moving the art around. How do I get the changes from the local post just to propagate to the cloud Carter B? So Carter B is a web service, so we need a web transport to push the changes over. As it, as it happens, I wrote one of those. The HTTP extension for PostgreSQL. Uh, there's nothing spatial about this extension. It just allows you to make HTTP calls using Postgres functions. So you can run an HTTP GET function and get back the results from a web service. Uh, not just the content, but also the MIME type, the status codes, the headers, and so on. And not just restricted to GET, you can run POST and PUSH and DELETE. So you can interact with any HTTP web service. And here's the thing, CardaDB has a web service API, the, the SQL API. You can manage, you can imagine what that is. The SQL API is actually, it's diabolically simple. You call an HTTP endpoint, you tell it what format you want your return to be in, JSON or GeoJSON, and you hand it SQL. If you're altering the data or the data is private, you have to provide an API key to prove who you are, and then you just provide the SQL you want executed. It's so, it's so diabolical, I actually described it um, a couple years before it was invented as the architecture of evil. Since uh, if you just provide an unprotected SQL pass-through on the web, there's so much evil the outside world could work on your database. Um, of course, the CardDB API is protected against SQL injection, and users are isolated in their own databases, so it's not really the same thing as I described in 2009. But fundamentally, it's the same idea. It's incredibly lightweight. It passes the SQL into the database, completely unexpected. Um, the simplicity of the approach, though, it, it allows for incredible flexibility in building applications, since there's no need at the HTTP interface to reinvent things that proxy for SQL. Um, and there's, there's no shortage of examples of web APIs out there. So, oh, I'm going to build a spatial web API, or even a non-spatial web API, and they, fought, and they go and they invent this dialect, which ends up being something that just gets unspooled to SQL on the server side all the time. So WFS from the OGC is the classic, you know, whole XML dialect. And it turns out that on the client side, you spool it up, and on the server side, you spool it back down. If you just inspect your SQL to make sure it's safe, you can skip all those steps. So for the example of federation, uh, I used QGIS as an editor, and I directly edited my local PostGIS database. And each database update, in turn, triggered an HTTP POST call uh, using the HTTP extension, which passed the update to the CarDB SQL API. This, in turn, was applied to the CarDB database which made it visible to me in the Chrome rendering. So it's diabolical, it's pure evil in action. Um, here's the local database trigger that updates CarDB. This one's only tied to update events, um, but if we were doing a full CRUD service, we could make an insert and a delete version too. 
Um, to write to CarterDB, we needed to authenticate, so we provide a key. The SQL to update the table is relatively simple, since we're updating the location field, only updating the location field, so a more complete version might update all the fields. We have to URL encode the SQL so we can pass it through the HTTP, and then we run the HTTP post to go up to CarterDB, and then we check the return code to make sure it actually came back with a good response. And then we're done, we can return the new tuple back to the database to write it in. And that's all it, that's all it is. So here it is in action. I have positioned my QGIS window on the top for editing and my CarterDB map on the bottom so I could see the results. Um, and to edit a point, I just move it and mash the save button in QGIS and then re refresh the CarterDB window and see that the changes have been sent up. Ta-da! So the trigger method is nice. It's a cute little incremental solution, but if you want something even simpler operating in Bash, I'd say this solution from Martin Jensen is even more diabolical. <laughs> it just dumps the table directly into curl. <laughs> so this example uses CSV, then just slams it right up onto the CardoDB import API. So it's a, a, one, a one SQL call, throw a table onto, uh, onto CardoDB example. It was fun because I was writing my incremental one at the same time, I saw this one go by on Twitter, and just my jaw, jaw kind of dropped. Like, oh, <laughs> I thought I was evil. So that was an example of pushing up, moving data from a local PostGIS database to a remote HTTP host. How about a, a push down or pull down, getting data down from the cloud into a local PostGIS database? Can we do the reverse? So sure we can. Uh, there's a fancy SQL standard called MED, Management of External Data. Um, which is exposed in PostgreSQL um, as real-world functionality uh, called foreign data wrappers, or FDW. <coughs> so foreign data wrappers are my current bet noir. I love foreign data wrappers. Uh, they expose what looks like to a client using the database, just looks like a table. And you access that data by running select queries on it. Uh, you can change it by running insert updates and deletes on it. But behind the scenes, a foreign data wrapper table can be anything at all. Right? Uh, in this diagram, you know, it can be a table on a remote database, but not necessarily even a remote Postgres database. There's wrappers for Oracle, there's wrappers for MySQL. Um, it could even be a non-database data source, like a flat file, CSV. Um, or it could be a completely non-tabular data set, like a Twitter query. There's FDW implementations for all these things. However, the one I'm going to talk about today is an FDW wrapper I wrote for OGR, which is the vector side of Google, Google OGR. Uh, spatial data abstraction library. So it's a perfect fit in many ways for an FDW wrapper because it exposes, OGR exposes a very tabular kind of data. Spatial layers, they have multiple columns, multiple rows, it really looks exactly like a relation in the database. Um, but since it's a multi-format spatial library, by implementing an OGR foreign data wrapper, we get access to multiple formats for the price of writing just one wrapper. So it's really quite a, it's quite a development bargain. So this is what it looks like to expose a file geodatabase to Postgres using the OGR FDW. Now first you turn on the extension. Uh, then you create a server that references the data source. You can kind of see the, the intellectual history of the idea, the idea that the data source is a server. You know, they're thinking about database federation from the point of view of server federation, but in fact, anything can go in. In this case, it's an FGD, FGDB file. Finally, once you've got your server set up, you create a foreign table that in turn references that server. And it defines what columns the foreign server is going to return that you want to expose in your local database. So here's the same thing, only using CardoDB as the foreign server. Um, this works because Google OGR has a CardoDB driver. So even though CardoDB, and unfortunately, even though CardoDB is post just PostgreSQL underneath, we don't have direct access to the low-level database. We can't make a PSQL connection. Um, but we can go in through the SQL API. So we use the CardoDB OGR driver rather than a native Postgres driver. <clears throat> and then we define our foreign table to match the CardoDB table on the server side. Once it's defined, we can run queries locally on the table and get the results back just as if the data were local. So here's a distance query finding the seven nearest pieces of public art to the place, or to the piece named Fire in the Belly. So that's pretty cool. The OGR FDW driver is getting better all the time. Uh, now it can send quals, that is to say, um, where clauses, to the remote server so that only subsets of the data are sent back to the client. Uh, the next revision will do spatial filters, um, and then finally add update and insert support so it's possible to edit the remote data without ever leaving the friendly co confines of PostgreSQL. 
Okay. <clears throat> it's my third movement, but I figure like it would be ideal if I had four movements, because I could do like the four seasons. Da, 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 da. Summer, winter, fall, and spring. So right now the, the movement names are a little arbitrary. So time and tide. So in my abstract, I actually promised that I would show how to use postures to look into the future. So for this section, I want to turn it over to Karnak the Magnificent. Um, this is what Karnak does. You type a city into the autocomplete form, which is driven off a of Postgres query, of course. And based on the city, Karnak tells you if it's going to rain tomorrow. And this is all done with PostgreSQL and PostGIS. So the video was taken a couple weeks ago, so the answers are wrong. Um, but if you go to the demo page and try it out, you should find that Karnak is pretty accurate, or as accurate as a fortune teller could ever be expected to be. But, uh, but let's peel back the covers and see how the trick actually works. How does the magic go? It goes like this. NOAA is National Oceanographic Atmospheric Association, or Administration, is nice enough to publish their forecast data on a web directory. It's kept constantly up to date, and it's always the same directory name. You don't have to magically figure out what the next day is going to be. I pulled this data, this satellite, on February 27th. And uh, so they got forecasts, and for rain, they, uh, they have this file that are interested, that, that's called uh, POP12. And POP12 stands for probability of, probability of Precipitation. And the 12 stands for the forecast increments, so in 12-hour forecast increments. So if you download that file, uh, which is in NetCDF, and in particular the NOAA tweak on NetCDF called GRIB, if you download it, uh, convert it to GeoTIFF using Google and look at it in QGIS, this is which, uh, what you see, which is like totally awesome and trippy. <laughs> is that, right? How does that happen? Um, so Q just defaults to loading the TIFF with band one is red, band two is green, band three is blue. So it gives this really cool picture, lots of fun color mixing. Uh, but actually each band is meant to be viewed separately as a forecast period. And if you string them all together, you can kind of see the forecast pattern of precipitation moving, in this case, to east to west, which seasonally you kind of expect the general direction of weather and the jet stream moving in North America. So once the data are in GeoTIFF, we can use them in PostGIS because um, we have a, a raster importer for GeoTIFF. Um, but actually, it turns out, a little piece of useful information, getting an optimal conversion from NetCDF to GeoTIFF using Google is a bit of a learning experience. Uh, the default conversion preserved all five bands. I'd include the spatial reference syst, GRIB metadata, really, really good. But the input GRIB file was 1.5 megabytes, and the output file was 113 megabytes. <laughs> there is something very wrong here, right? So the first thing you notice when you pop open the output file is that the pixel type is double. Eight, bi eight bytes per pixel. But the input data is just integers from 0 to 100, just probability precipitation, and a no data value at 9999. So that data can really fit into a single byte. So you can get an eight-fold improvement for storage just by changing the pixel type from whatever you like to make it a byte. That's pretty easy. So that gets the output file down to 14 megs. So it's no longer 100 times larger than the input, but it's only 10 times larger. Still pretty terrible. Um, and when you look at the TIFF and QGIS, in this case, you see there's some pretty nasty imperfections uh, because the no data value is 9999, which doesn't fit in a byte. So you have to coerce those down to a better no data value, one that you know where it is, but it's outside your data range. So I chose 255 in this case. But actually, the file is still pretty large. It's still 14 megs, so what's going on there? Uh, it turns out that Google produces an uncompressed GeoTIFF by default. So we have to explicitly ask for decompression. Please, please, Google, compress my TIFF before you write it for me. Uh, Deflate does an excellent job. So that gets it down to 1.4 megabytes. That's about the same size as the original. Uh, but it turns out that the Deflate actually has some options to twiddle. Uh, we can get a slightly higher compression level, uh, add it to go up to Z level 9, because we don't mind using a tiny bit more RAM. Um, and we can use a scanline predictor which makes sense because the data tends to be spatially autocorrelated. And that gets the file down to just one megabyte. That's a pretty nice improvement over the 113 megabyte default conversion. So yeah, don't, don't just, the, the moral for me was, don't just believe that Google knows you, has your best interest at heart. Um, it's, it's worth it to go back and see what's going on. So, one part of our solution is, um, is what, what does Karnak mean when he says tomorrow? Uh, what's the weather going to be tomorrow? Um, so to figure out what we're going to do to get the prediction for tomorrow, it helps look at the output from Google Info. 
So there's five bands in the GeoTIFF. Uh, Google does a great job of preserving the original GRIB metadata format. We can figure out what each band means. So the first band, in this case, is good for 10 hours after the file was generated. The second band is good for 22 hours. Third band goes for 34 hours. Fourth band goes for 46 hours. So each band has a valid time, which gives the UTC stamp timestamp when the forecast expires. And if I was doing this and really want to do a good job of it, I could use the UTC timestamp, and that would be a very nice job, but I wasn't into doing a good job. So there's two ways to solve the problem, the right way, which I didn't do, and my way, which is just to say, ah, bands three and four, they're kind of far out in the future. <laughs> you know, 36 hours, that, that's a, that, that feels like tomorrow. Um, and I'll average them together. I'll take the, the combined probability of precipitation across those two, so I increase my odds of getting it right if the rain's gonna fall. So before I can do any averaging, I need to load the data, which uh, involves the usual opaque command line syntax. Well, there's nothing too crazy here. We chose um, 32 by 32 chips in the database because we have um, a one byte pixel uh, times 32 by 32 uh, times five bands per uh, tile. That implies about a 5K tile, which is slightly smaller than the 8K page size for Postgres. Once all the data are loaded, we just need two SQL queries to make Kar bring Karnak to life. Oops. So there's our tile size. Oh. Custom SRS, it turns out that the uh, NOAA data doesn't come in an SRS, which is part of the default spatial ref sys tile, so I had to pull out the well-known text and stuff it into the spatial ref sys and give it a number. 9001 is what I chose. Um, so in order to make Karnak work, we need an autocomplete query. In this case, I didn't go for full text search. I just did straight up first few letters, get the 10 closest things with those letters, but order them by population, so a rough importantness of city in my autocomplete. And then the second query is the one that generates the probability guess for Karnak. And like all queries that involve the raster subsystem of PostGIS, it's unbearably long. I don't know why <laughs> the raster stuff just is, it, it takes a lot of SQL to get it done. So step one, uh, we've got a city. This is, it's selected by ID actually in the web app, but in this case I did it by name. Um, so find the particular city we're getting the, getting the guess for. Uh, take it and buffer it out, uh, in this case, by 10 kilometers. So now I've got a circle. Then take that circle and find all the chips that intersect it. And for all those chips, mask out just the pixels which fall inside my circle. That's the ST clip function there. So that's a little bit of raster vector math. Finally, when I have things masked out, I can take the bits that are left behind and summarize all the pixels in them. And the summary stats returns not just one summary, but several. It turns min, max, average, standard deviation. I don't know if it returns median or mode. Uh, but anyways, it returns a suite of stats for the pixels which are not no datas in all the chips. We'll just take the biggest of the biggest, and that will be what we return. So the highest probability of precipitation across the whole area around the city is what Karnak uses to, uh, to generate his guesses. This is kind of what it looks like visually. Take a city make a circle around it, find all the chips that hit this circle, in this case one, and then a little bit of the other one, mask out all the pixels inside the circle, and find the maximum probability precipitation across the two bands we care about, it returns one number. Karnak uses that to give his result. Now Karnak is a real-time game, so in order to keep Karnak up to date, I've got a little process running on my home computer every six hours. Uh, it goes to NOAA, slurps down the forecast, converts into GeoTIFF, stuffs it back up into an S3 bucket. Uh, because I want to run this live on CardoDB, when I defined my POP12 table in CardoDB, I set it up to do an automatic sync. So I set it up for daily. I didn't want to spend a lot of load on it. But basically, every refresh period, CardoDB will slurp down the file you've targeted and load it back up as a, as a fresh table. So that's why Karnak is still up to date looking into the future. So that was the future. We're doing time travel here. What about the past? Can we do anything about recording history? So the usual historical perspective, you know, if we want to write history, first we have to win. We have to be in control, like a database administrator. And then we need some triggers. So suppose we have a very simple base table, uh, but this approach works for any complex table too. To record history, we need to make a second table that exactly mirrors it in structure. So this is a table of addresses, um, simple as possible address table, just a single address line and where the address is. 
the history table, in addition to the main columns, the actual data column that has some metadata columns, a creation timestamp and who did it, a deletion timestamp and who did it, and then a unique primary key of its own. And using this structure, we can figure out for any given time what features were live. That is, what features had been created by that time but had not yet been deleted. So a query to find the state of data on July 16th would look like this. Any, create, any record created before July 16th, good, but not yet deleted on or after July 16th, or not deleted at all. So put it into action. In order to maintain the history log, we have to attach a trigger to the working table. So whenever a new record is inserted into the main table, the trigger inserts the same data into the history table with the metadata about who inserted it and when. So that gives us all additions. Uh, whenever someone deletes a table, the trigger updates the history table noting who did the deleting and when the deletion occurred. And finally, an update is just handled by a deletion of the current state followed by an insertion of the new state at the current time. Once you got that little trigger, you can attach it to the main table as a trigger on insert, update, and delete actions to keep the history table in sync. And here's what it looks like in action. So we start from an empty addresses table. I uh, set up an actual database with the addresses and history tables, the trigger enabled, but nothing in it. Uh, and then I added three records using our favorite uh, GIS editor, QGIS. And the part I like about this way of tracking history, doing it in the database, um, not with some terrible middleware, is that it doesn't matter how you generate the edits. Um, you can generate the edits with QGIS in this case, um, but you could also be generating the edits with a web service. You could have GeoServer tacked on top of this table, doing WFS transactions. Um, any JDBC application could generate the edits, or you could just hand run bits of SQL on the command line. No matter who does it or how, you're getting it logged in the history table. So that's good, because it means that your history infrastructure doesn't have to be maintained as the application infrastructure around it changes. And so you can keep it around for a long time. So I've got three, uh, three points added in. Bob, and I can't see it on my display. So after performing the edits, I've got three records in my main table. Um, and also, because these are three tracked inserts, three records in my history table. So that's what the history table looks like, although I've taken out the who in the uh, thing. I just have the creation times. It's always me who is doing it. Um, since they have not been deleted yet, the deleted field is still null. And you can actually see when I made the screencast from the creation dates. So you now know how long I prepare beforehand. Um, so now I use Q just to edit the records. So I just take each one, change the location. Um, in this demo, I hit save after each one so they'd all have distinct change dates. Otherwise, QGIS would just submit the changes in a batch. And you wouldn't couldn't tell which one I edited first. So I go through, I move them all around. I could also have just changed the names and left them in place. This isn't about moving things necessarily. It's about any change on the record at all. So now the history has three more records. The original insertions are still there, but they're marked as deleted. And for each deletion, there is a replacing addition record that has the current state of the data in it. And if I want to look into my history table then and find out what the state was at any previous time, I just run a query that looks like this. And you can imagine uh, from a web app or any other app how easy it is to put a slider bar on, and move it back and forth. Um, for something like CarterDB, it is, as usual, diabolical because you would just set your SQL on your layer to something like this in response to the slider bar moving back and forth. Or um, institutionally, if you want to find out what a particular person is doing, because the history of who's doing it is also tracked, you can go back and find the edits that are being run by a particular user. So things like reverting the changes of a certain user or changes associated with a certain edit session get a lot easier when you maintain a full edit log on your data. So we've talked a bit about full text search handling, um, federated searchings, handling time a little bit, the future and the past, but there's actually a whole bunch more PostgreSQL features we could talk about because PostgreSQL is such a beautiful, beautiful database. So here's some homework, take this home. When you get home, open up PostgreSQL and then learn and experiment a bit with time ranges and support for time in Postgres in general. Um, the time range support is better than I've seen in any other database. It just boggles my mind how beautiful it is and simple. It's, just, it's intuitive in the way that no other time support I've seen is. Arrays, um, especially things like array operators. You can find parts inside an array. You can concatenate and take subsets out of arrays. You can aggregate portions of your tables into arrays, which makes it possible to do really complex um, processing just inside the database. 
and then regular expressions. And don't just look at the operators, like this example here, the little tilde operator. Those are good for search. Very nice, you can do regular expression searches. But also look at the regular expression functions. Because you can do not just searches, but also replaces, alterations of your strings. You can do really advanced data editing and cleansing, again, just in the database using SQL. You don't have to write external processes to do these things. They're all extremely well implemented in Postgres. Um, and in these cases, all poorly implemented in pretty much any other database I've seen if they have them at all. So that's been Magical Postgres in three brief movements. Thanks very much. Um, before I say bye, there is a new book coming out on PG Routing. It's called PG Routing, A Practical Guide. Have a look at it. It'll be out in New Year. Um, this is another sort of add-on magical feature for Postgres, so you can quickly do point-to-point -point routing and all, with all sorts of algorithms. And PG Routing covers all the basics as well as all the advanced stuff. So, any questions? Hey, hey. Yeah. You're talking about basically you, your desktop user has the file key database and then you have a. Uh, no. So the foreign data wrappers are set up within the context of the server. So the server has to be able to access that file geo database. So it would have to be in some location where the server could read it. Any other questions? Hey. <coughs> when you're able to hit a web service in a trigger, yeah. do you need a specific, is, is that available in 9.3 or do you have to go up to like a later version or? Yeah, so that, that is a, that's an extension. So it'll work against 9.3, but you have to build and install it yourself, oh. um, the web trigger. There's also a foreign data wrapper version of the same thing called FTW underbar www. But that, too, re requires compilation and installation. Okay, and I just know that I'm using Amazon RDS for holding my... Yeah. Um, stuff, and there are, there are extensions that they don't allow. Yes, which is, yeah, there's a very limited set, more it's fair to say there's a very limited set of things they do allow. And, uh, and yeah, that kind of crazy stuff is definitely not among them. Um, does anyone know if they allow PL Python? Nope. They do not. Okay, so yeah, you're kind of out of luck. I've also seen people do web calls with PL Python, but that is also not on the list. So for RDS, you're probably out of luck for that kind of craziness. And that's probably just as well. In many respects, it's a very scary way to do things because it will block until it gets a result back. Yeah, well, I, I actually was trying to do that because another database dumped into my database once a night, mm. and I wanted to trigger a process when that happens. Um, yeah. The whole inter-process communication thing. But uh, yeah, no, with RDS, you, they control the horizontal and the vertical. They also haven't updated their post just since they deployed. So if anyone knows someone in the RDS ops team, tell them their post just <laughs> is full of security holes and crasher bugs. Please replace it. It's 2.1.0. It's from 18 months ago. Any other questions? Wait the back. Do you have your slides Not yet, but I will put them onto the website for sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Thanks a lot, everybody. <laughs>